thanks to the organizers for somehow magically managing to arrange everything to flow so beautifully together. Um, let me know if you see my screen okay. It's okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, good to be with everyone today. And so good that people have taken time off a Saturday at such a difficult, difficult time to be here. Um, so this presentation is based on my research on what we commonly term informal in African context and other contexts. Um, I'm going to present uh, my concepts, which I call informalization through a historical examination of architectures in Africa. And I'm, through this, I'm arguing for an approach to sustainable, inclusive, resilient urbanization that centers these informal African architectures. So the term African architecture brings to mind different images for all of us, I'm certain, depending on where we are from and what we, we are aware of. Um, perhaps you're thinking of these ancient monumental buildings like the pyramids in Egypt, or you're thinking of rural huts and villages, or perhaps you're thinking of the new trend of star architects designing celebrated buildings on the African continent, um, as such as captured, uh, captured in this slide. But now let's do some architectural history, which always also is the history of power and politics and socioeconomics in Africa. This label architecture has not always been so easily and freely ascribed to buildings in Africa throughout history, because the term architecture to describe built space has always been political and still is political. So from Early anthropologists, colonial anthropologists and explorer accounts of Africa, we often find built spaces portrayed and described in, in terms that are meant to denote that they are less than what architecture is supposed to be. So we get terms such as dwellings, such as habitats, hovels, huts, and very few accounts that sort of celebrate and recognize what they are seeing. And in what happens alongside in these like um, diminishes is that the material knowledge, construction technologies and techniques are also being systematically undermined and diminished. Um, among other reasons, of course, this is a tool of domination. Wherever there's a more powerful um, power, um, these things happen. But in even cases where the buildings are too massive, too undeniably beautiful, too monumental or too impressive to overlook, we get very far-fetched theories about where they can come from. So in this slide, you see the ruins of Great Zimbabwe, which for a long time were attributed to aliens from outer space because they did not want to believe that people, black people living in Zimbabwe could have done this. The pyramids in Egypt as well, also for a long time had extraterrestrial origins ascribed to them. So what we saw or what we see is that as African architectures and African architectural traditions are being diminished, European architectures and building traditions are being elevated on the same African continent. And additionally, because most things from Europe were associated with power and prestige, both by suggestion and both by brutal force, Africans, leading first with the elites and followed by the less well-off, eventually en masse adopt and adapt these imported materials, construction styles and technologies and, and, and architectural styles. And in many British colonial capitals such as Accra, there's actually laws that ban building in earth and other natural, what we will now call sustainable materials and technologies. All new constructions, and in this slide, I have a, a permit schedule from the early 1900s. And these things demand that all new constructions have to be done in um, imported materials, including some that are not imported, but were very environmentally harmful to extract such as stone. So this 
marginalization, this diminution, this exclusion of traditional African architectures, construction methods is what I term unformalization. It sounds a bit like informalization and I, I coin a new word because it's a different thing happening here. And this unformalization leads to the making of what I call informal African architectures, which are these excluded, marginalized, minoritized architectures. And minoritized because they're not in the minority. These in most African countries, most African cities, these form of architectures form the large part of what exists, but they are minoritized because they are diminished in the, the hierarchy of building. And often we find these in rural areas, but also in urban areas, especially among the urban poor and otherwise outside the reach of states and institutional control. So let's come back to the present. One of the main focus points of this conference and other great conferences about urbanization in Africa, of course, is sustainability. And a lot of academics, people who have presented all today have rightly identified the need for more environmentally friendly, context specific, appropriate sustainable constructions, among other things to help slow the pace or stop it, stop the pace completely of climate change. And a large part of this involves the use of these suitably sourced, locally available, environmentally friendly materials. But we find that people are slow to adopt. Henry just mentions this in, in, in his last um, in his presentation with the example about the cement that, um, the concrete that has um, locally available earth in it. So in same in Accra, we find that after centuries of the state, the town planning authorities, the architecture, engineering, licensing bodies, discouraging people from building with sustainable materials, now they are facing a steep uphill climb to get people to move away from these unsustainable materials. And essentially, the irony is that the kinds of approaches to architecture and construction and planning, which are now are, are now being pushed are the same ones, the essence of it are the same ones that were first diminished as being an unformalized. And it seems like what is, was backward is now what's the plan for the future. So I, I argue that unformalization hasn't ended. It didn't end with um, independence because ideas of what is good building, what is proper building, what is beautiful still persist. And lots of these ideas are based in Western training because even for the first independence leaders of a lot of African countries, they received Western educations as have pretty much everyone else who has had formal education in these countries. So these things are in our mind and these ideas of what is good and what is good in architecture and urbanism have persisted. Building regulations denote what is permissible or not, and a lot of this is just refracted through Western ideas of modernity or colonial ideas of modernity. And not everyone in the city is wealthy due to the capitalist structures of society, but everyone eventually finds a place to take shelter to sleep. So in all our cities everywhere, we will always have unformalized and formal African architectures. And because unformalization by state authorities and even institutional bodies like architecture and engineering councils always results in informal architectures. So I'd like to invite us to think about a various urban contexts across Africa and the informal architectures that exist in our cities and think deeply about why they are unformalized. Like what are the reasons we think these things are considered a nuisance or a problem? Like structures like stalls, kiosks, shacks and the like, those that are unlikely to have received a permit for construction or had a professional architect or engineer design them. Now I'm not arguing that the physical forms of and materiality of stalls and kiosks and shacks, whatever you call them, where you're from, need to be copied and utilized per se, but that rather than aiming to destroy and replace, we might and we should learn from them. 
a little illustration. Take the problem of street hawkers. A lot across West Africa, this is always a thing that comes up in urban municipal um, authority reports. So many cities have this problem and the root of this, of course, is lack of employment and the economic situations. But every city tack tries to tackle this issue. So during my field, my recent field work for a project, I actually interviewed a number of hawkers about this because in, in Accra and in Kumasi, which are both in Ghana, for a number of times, the city authorities created a market for about a few weeks, the hawkers would stay in the market and then they would stop using it. And this keeps happening and a lot of money spent on the new beautiful market, commissioned with a lot of fanfare, and the cycle keeps repeating. And this is the same in Nigeria and other West African cities. So during my field work, I interviewed some hawkers. I thought it was, of course, common sense to interview the users of this thing. But none of them had been consulted ever before for such a thing. And for them, when we were talking about why they didn't want these permanent spaces, mobility was such an important issue to them because they needed to be able to move to new locations which might have gatherings of people because this sometimes spontaneously happens. Sometimes these are planned like soccer matches, funerals, weddings, and people would want to go and hawk their worst there and they can't carry their whole stall because it's permanent in this designated market. And customers also do not like to go because often these markets are located in places that are out of the way. Um, so mobility allows them to move to new locations and, and quickly adapt their words to changing circumstances and changing demands. And this is just one example of taking lessons from informal architectures and their users, not necessarily to replicate, but to get the essence of what the people actually need. And these are the people who form the majority of people who live in African cities. In conclusion, centering and formal architectures is learning from the errors of the past to inform the future we want for our urban areas, which is inclusive, sustainable, and resilient. Being careful to understand what is actually sustainable in specific locations and circumstances, to understand what resilience is, resilience as distinct from struggles to survive and not glorify um, struggles to survive. And inclusivity as more than ticking check boxes and identifying diverse views and approaches to the problems that we all face. Thank you. Thank you, Kukuwa. Uh, I don't see any questions so far, but uh, I, I may start the discussion. Uh, who is going to learning from the past? I agree fully, but who is going to, or, or where is the, the knowledge going to be centered and be, where is the memory going to be? <laughs> Um, so for me, as, as someone who uses historical methods often, it's, it's so easy to see patterns that at any point in society, you get the most accurate view of what is going to happen from the common people mm. and from the people who form the majority of users of, of a thing or in a space or the population. And usually you, if you make things work well, if you make a society that works for the least powerful, the most marginalized, it's usually better for everyone else. And you would think, of course, that this would be common sense and um, future generations would easily learn from the past, but we, these things keep repeating. So for approaches to urbanization for any project, the first thing is when, when the team of experts is assembled, the first thing should always be to be able to identify who the users are and speak to them, which seems so basic, but often is, is never done. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I see it, the, the, the chat, and uh, I think most, there is yeah, plenty of messages but they all deal with earth and construction. 
Uh, I see one from Wolfram that's saying that says how should education of students okay, learn okay. from that model. And yeah, I agree it's, it's it's easier for architecture than engineering, but I think it's again based on my experience from KNUST and in, in Kumasi in Ghana. I think that's just because of how the curricula are structured. And I think that maybe engineers take themselves a little bit too seriously and will uh, benefit from going into the field and trying different research methods. Um, because it, it, it's as simple as sending people out. When, when you want your students to do a design for a bridge or for a new plane, it's as simple as sending them out to the places where they use those bridges to actually mm -hmm. talk about people, to put the calculations aside for a while. They're important and you always get there, it's standard. Mm -hmm. But just find out things and you might be surprised that sometimes they actually don't want a bridge. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, it's Tando, true that... I see a question from Tando. Okay, good. How do you think we can change the perception on on the African architecture on the continent? I I think it's already changing actually, and the same way as it was systematically stripped down of its power and its meaning over time, over time it's with if things continue as they are because. African architects are finding new pride in their history. Um, we saw um, earlier on, um, Prof. Alexander shared um, the image of the Tabo in Becky Presidential Library, which is designed by David J. a Ghanaian architect. This is a new thing. If you look at his earlier work, it's very um, Western style modernist black boxes. Mm -hmm. And his later style is embracing this earth material, this warmth to it. And I think People like him leading the way is marking a trend and young architects always like to follow the star architects and it's already happening and if we continue to sort of privilege and show that Tabo Mbeki Presidential Library can't be built in mud, it's, it's already a paradigm shift. So the more of this that we see, it's, I think it's inevitable if it's sustained over time. May I ask you a question? I think we yeah. still have a few minutes. Uh, I know that, for instance, in France, engineers and architects are trained in totally different institutions. In other countries, like Belgium or the United States, they are much closer to each other. What is the situation in Africa? Of course, Africa is so diverse that I imagine the situation is very different in very different countries, but what is it generally? Are they together or very separate? So I, I train in Ghana and by necessity, they are in the same institution, but at different departments and a very historical rivalry, mm -hmm. which I don't know where it starts <laughs> from, <laughs> but they do not like one another. Um, engineers accuse architects of being ridiculous and architects <laughs> accuse engineers of being too strict and not Im imaginative enough. Looks but familiar. I can that the best projects have such close collaboration mm -hmm. between them that it's a bit, it's a bit ridiculous to me. So I, I don't know if it's the same in other African countries, but they work together because they have to by law, but not happily. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, let's look. Uh... Uh, there is still one. Okay, then. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> and let's switch to uh, Esther. Uh, 